Uh, so I'm Emily, thanks for the introduction, Charlotte, um, and thanks for having me as well this evening. And I, I'm so excited to be here. I feel very honoured to be invited to be part of the Meet the Scientist series. Um, and it's extra exciting because this week it's part of uh, Scotland's Explorathon Science Week. So I'm going to take you on a bit of a whistle stop tour around the fourth with what we can expect to see and some of the impacts that affect marine mammals. And then I'm going to talk about the research, the projects that you can help in um, to help conserve and learn more about the marine mammals that we see in the fourth. So. By trade, uh, I'm a marine biologist and a marine mammal scientist. So I've worked on lots of different species, both in the UK and abroad. Um, I've spent time working at a research lab, Orca Lab in Canada, uh, recording the calls of Northern resident killer whales. And there's an amazing video that Orca Lab took of a uh, killer whale rubbing its belly on the rubbing beaches over there. Um, I've also spent uh, four years working at the Sea Mammal Research Unit, which is based in St. Andrews. Uh, working on bottlenose dolphin photo ID, so that involves going out on the boat a few days a week and taking pictures focusing on the dorsal fins and then spending a lot of time in the office like on the picture in the top corner there um, matching fins so you can identify dolphins um, by the unique shapes and the nicks and scratches on the fins. So similarly, I also spent time on the west coast of Scotland and around the Northern Isles, taking pictures of harbour seals to ID them so you can identify harbour seals based on their pelage pattern. So the little spots that they've got on them are all unique and so you're able to identify each individual by matching up their spots, a bit like dot to dot. So. Alongside all of that, I've worked on wildlife watching boats and I've worked as a consultant as well, making recommendations to industry on how we can reduce our impacts to marine mammals. So all of this has now led me to uh, where I'm based now, which is at Harriet Watt University. Uh, so I'm doing a PhD looking at cumulative human impacts on marine mammals. So my work covers most of the UK, but the fourth has got a very special place in my heart because it's where I work, it's where I live, and um, we've also got a few projects that are running out of it, which I'll get to discuss later. So I'm excited to tell you more about the fourth. Um, so the fourth, it's an estuary. It runs from Stirling uh, right down under the three big bridges, which is where it starts to turn into becoming the sea rather than an estuary. It's more of a marine environment after that. And that runs right down into the North Sea, so out the back of the Isle of May. It's about 60 miles long and about 20 miles wide at its widest part. So from Fife Ness down to about St Ab's Head is where it's at its widest at its mouth. Um, at its deepest, it's about 46 metres deep, which is um, actually the height of nine double-decker buses, which I thought was pretty impressive, it would fit in the bottom of the fourth. But actually, um, for most of the fourth, it's a lot shallower than that, so maybe one to three double-decker buses deep. Um, and the fourth is, of course, home to some fantastic wildlife. That's why we're here, and that's what I'm going to talk about later. Uh, including the Isle of May, the Bass Rock. It's got lots of cool different environments and habitats for, for mammals and animals to occupy. So it has also got a lot of humans. So um, one thing I think it's important to consider when we're thinking about marine mammals is just how many humans around the Forth have an impact on that environment. So around the Forth, living within the catchment area of the Forth, um, is 1.3 million people, which is kind of mind boggling. And actually that's a quarter of Scotland's population live within the catchment of the Firth of Forth. So there's a huge amount of people, including probably most of us that are on this call that have an impact on the quality of the Forth and the quality of the, the environment for the marine mammals within it. So not only are there lots of humans, uh, there are lots of marine mammals and just this year there's been loads of different species spotted in the fall. We've seen striped dolphins, say whales, minke whales, uh, the humpback whale earlier this year, harbour porpoise, um, bottlenose dolphins and this is by no means an exhaustive list of what you can see in the fall but it just gives you a bit of a flavour of how much life there actually is in the fall. And all of this has been spotted from land which I think is a really cool thing to point out. You don't need to go on a boat or an expensive boat trip to go and see them, you can see all of them from land, which is amazing. So um, 
rather than do the usual and give you a detailed account of every single species that's seen and give all the biology details about it, I wanted to do it a little bit differently and zoom in on some species that are returning to the forth after long periods of absence. So once I've introduced you to a few of those, then we'll dive into the history of the forth. So you might wonder why I'm going to talk about the history. You've signed up to hear about marine mammals, not history. But actually, I think because of the amount of humans that are around the forth and how much impact we've had on the environment, it's really important that when we're talking about marine mammals, we think about why they're here or why they're not here and how humans have affected them and how this has changed over time. Um, so this should help us understand and appreciate a bit more all the awesome animals that we've got in the forth today. Um, so one of the main attractions in the forth this year, aside from the say whale, was a visit from Barney the humpback whale. Um, but it's pretty fascinating to look at old records when you realise that actually humpbacks haven't really ever been seen here in very high numbers, um, it seems. So if you look bit at the Strandings record, so between 1306 and 1918, so we're talking like between 700 and 100 years ago, there were only three humpbacks ever reported stranded on the whole east coast of Scotland. So one of these was in the fourth, so that was in 1690. And then in the late 1800s, there was one in Wick and one in Dundee. So really, there's very little record of there being evidence of many humpbacks around here at all. Um, but more recently, sightings are getting a little more sporadic, a little bit more frequent. So there was a humpback in the 4th in February in 2003. That was the first confirmed sighting. And then every two to three uh, years or so there was a few sightings until 2017 when it seems like everything kind of changed. So since 2017 there's been one or more humpbacks spotted every year in winter in the inner firth of Forth. So we know the different ones because um, we can look at photo ID. So that is when the humpback is coming up to the surface to breathe it takes two or three be breaths normally and on the third breath it kind of it takes a deeper dive and it lifts its fluke out of the water. And if you take a photograph of that fluke, it'll have unique markings on, like you can see on the, the far right corner uh, picture on this slide. Um, and they have different markings on them. And the trailing edge, which is the edge highest up on the picture, tends to have different uh, shapes and patterns that stay the same over time. So it's a, a way that we can identify which whales which. And you can also identify it as well based on the dorsal fin, which you can see in the top left corner. So um, Lindsay McNeil's got a really keen eye for spotting these matches. And she's managed to match some animals from the forth with other whales that have been seen all over the place. So there's matches like in Norway, Ireland, Shetland, off the west coast of Scotland as well. And all of that information comes from just one picture. And most of the time, these are pictures that are taken from land, which I think is just amazing. Um, so why are they coming back? Um, there are multiple reasons, but nobody really knows the answer. But maybe, maybe it's because they're recovering from whaling. Maybe they're expanding the distribution. Maybe they're following the prey as the prey is changing uh, its distribution as well. Um, but while I go through the rest of the talk, uh, it'd be cool to hear anybody else's ideas about why they think that the humpbacks are coming back. And hopefully going to be here to stay, fingers crossed. So bottlenose dolphins are another relatively recent re visitor to the fourth. Uh, you can now see them almost daily in the summer months. They're pretty regular visitors. So the dolphins that we see here are from a population known as the East Coast population. So they were kind of initially known as the Murray Firth population because that's mainly the only place that they were seen until like the late 90s, early 2000s, when they started being spotted more frequently down the East Coast of Scotland. Then now it's like they're seeing them right down in Yorkshire, down in Cornwall, over in Ireland, sometimes even on the other side of the North Sea. So we know that there are about 200 individuals in this population because of photo ID, like I talked about earlier, using those unique markings and shapes on the dorsal fins to work out how many there are and to work out how many individuals there are in that population. So this has been an ongoing project led by the University of Aberdeen and in collaboration with SMU since about the 90s. 
Um, and if you take any pictures uh, that are good enough quality to photo ID the animals and you can submit them to SRU to the Citizens Fins project and they should get back to you and tell you who it is and, and it'll be really useful to them to know who was where. Um, so if you're taking pictures of the animals you're definitely certainly more likely to be seeing them in the summer months. Um, but but previously they've been pretty rare. So prior to this range expansion from the Murray Firth, it seems historically they weren't seen very much. There's anecdotal reports of dolphins being known to fishermen in the 17 and early 1800s in the Forth, subject to a little bit of exploitation possibly. And then from about the 1830s onwards, they kind of became virtually unknown in the Forth until about the 90s. So here's a quote from a book published in 1881 that says um, that bottlenose dolphins appear to be found occasionally, but are by no means common. So why might dolphins have disappeared off the radar for 150 years? Well, one reason might be water quality. So let's think about this in a bit more detail. So if you go back two or 300 years, there wouldn't really be much amiss with the water quality in the fourth probably. The inputs were still largely natural, the populations were low enough that they weren't having too much impacts on the environment. There was little industry, not many nasty chemicals around. Um, Edinburgh had a population of about 40,000 people and in those days they dealt with sewage by throwing it out of the windows onto the streets where the farmers would pick it up and then go and use it for fertilizer to grow wheat and in turn the wheat would make bread. So kind of a circular uh, way of looking after the sewage. But in the 1800s it kind of all went a bit pear-shaped because the population expanded tenfold from 40 thousand to 400,000 people so waste management became a big problem and um, there were outbreaks of disease and one of the uh, ways to deal with all these um, additional population was to construct sewers so but the sewers aren't the ones that we think about today these are just huge pipes that were pumping all the sewage out into the sea so straight out into the fourth untreated um, and alongside this, industries were developing. So there was things like the linen, paraffin oil, textile, paper mills and mines all pumping their wastewater straight out into the forth as well, uh, untreated. So very toxic water all coming out at once in the mid 1800s into the forth. So this just led to the complete extinction of some fish species from the rivers and from the forth itself. And it meant that the fourth became colonized by um, species that liked the sewage um, and that a lot of fish uh, rely on like healthy waters and they rely on oxygen rich waters. Uh, so unfortunately they became extinct uh, in those times. So not really much reason for a dolphin to come here then, bad water quality and not much food. Uh, and it, then even as recently as the 70s, this was still going on. So Edinburgh was discharging almost a quarter of a million cubic meters per day of sewage into the fourth in the 70s, which is kind of terrifying. Thankfully, uh, because of the EU, water quality regulations came in and Edinburgh also got a proper sewage treatment plant in the late 70s. And now by and large, the water in the fourth is actually the best quality it's been for say 150 or 200 years. So perhaps this is one of the reasons why the dolphins are coming back and the the fishermen that saw them in the 16 and 1700s but missed them for 100 or so years um, reported not seeing them. So it is kind of a good news story for sure for the water quality and the sewage treatment, but there are some other harmful substances used in industries like chemical manufacture, paper mills, uh, farming, mining, oil refineries that don't break down easily in the environment. So they leave more of a permanent legacy. So these harmful uh, chemicals are known as persistent bioaccumulating toxins or persistent organic pollutants. And they can accumulate in animal and human tissue causing long-term damage. Although lots of them are now banned and in fact, they've been banned since probably the eighties, some of them. Many can still be found in the sediment and the water in the fourth if you test it, which is really scary. And it's also more scary that it can be found if you test marine mammals. And even if you test ourselves, we have evidence of some of these toxins within us as well. 
So an additional bit of the story is that plastics attract and absorb these toxins and they can concentrate them so that they have millions times the levels higher than the surrounding water. So if you imagine nurdles, these like tiny little plastic particles that are melted down in the manufacture of plastics, um, these act as a really good way to concentrate lots of horrible toxins onto them. And these are also quite a big source of marine litter. So uh, FIDRA and the Great Nurdle Hunt uh, sampled some nurdles that they'd collected from around the fourth and they found that they had really huge amounts of DDTs, PCBs and lots of other nasty toxins all along them. So this is really worrying because uh, areas around the fourth that were sampled for them, some of them had between 100 and over a thousand nurdles. So if you look at this um, map, the red ones and the black ones are the ones where there's between 100 and like over a thousand nurdles just at that one sample site. So it's kind of scary to think that this is very real and very real thing that's happening in the fourth. So furthermore, this is extra important when we're talking about marine mammals. Uh, because studies that have looked inside stranded marine mammals, including a harbour porpoise that stranded in the fourth, uh, have found microplastics in every single marine mammal sampled that, um, for microplastics, which is really scary if you think that there's lots of these little microplastics that are accumulating these toxins on them. So how does this get in marine mammals in the first place? Uh, it likely gets up the food chain. So through marine mammals eating fish who have ingested microplastics because when they're really teeny tiny, they look very similar to zooplankton, which is what the fish like to eat, or even look like little fish eggs, which bigger fish like to eat. So what on earth can we do about all of this? So remember at the start, I said about how about a quarter of Scotland's population is in within the catchment of the fourth. That means that any action that you take really will help the marine mammals that we get here. So if you do a litter pick um, at the beach or right up to cities and town, cities or towns, if you're really far inland, anything that you can do to stop this stuff, getting into the waterways will help. Um, not only this, what you choose to put down your sinks, your bath, your toilet also has very direct impacts on the fourth. So you'll recognize this label from household cleaning products, but so that demonstrates that it's toxic. So I don't still to this day do not understand why we're selling products that shouldn't be going down our waterways because they do exactly what that picture says, uh, kill marine life if they are in high enough numbers. So look for things when you're in the shops that are made from natural ingredients um, that don't have this horrible logo on it. There's other cleaning products you can use that use natural stuff like lemon juice. Um, that aren't going to have a damage on the environment when they end up in the sea. You can also um, reduce your use of single use plastics, you know, the drill, reuse plastic bags, take your own coffee cup, take your own water bottle, buy second hand or recycled product. And finally, educate yourself and others. Um, we can all never stop learning, so definitely keep that up. So, I'm going to do a bit of a U-turn now and go right back to considering species of marine mammals in the fourth and think about their history as well in a minute. So seals are another with a bit of a convoluted history here. So let's first learn like how we ID them in the first place so that we know which ones we're talking about. So on the left are harbour seals and on the right are grey seals. So uh, harbour seals have got the little, little spots uh, whereas the grey seals have got the bigger spots. You can kind of see it quite well in the picture at the top about how the pelage markings look quite different based on which species they are. Um, also noticeably, grey seals are quite a lot larger than harbour seals, which is fine if they're next to each other. It's more difficult if you just see one at a time. Um, but they live to kind of the same age, which I thought was quite interesting. So about 20 to 30 years old. And one way you can tell them apart if you've got a hall outside near your house um, and you're sort of watching them from a distance year round, if you look at the pups, it's the harbour seals that pup in the summer months. So they have pups that are black or dark and the pups are able to swim as soon as they're born. So they'll waddle off after mom while mom goes to get something to eat. 
and hang about in the water and kind of follow her around sometimes. So they'll suckle for two to three weeks, but they don't have any fur that they're going to be molting. But it's the grey seal pups that are the ones that are a little bit more iconic with the white fluffy fur, and they're born in winter. So they've got the white lanugo fur, they'll suckle for two to three weeks when they'll molt this fur off but they'll stay on land for the whole time so they're not really very good at fending for themselves so they won't be going swimming like the harbour seals pups do and the mom will stay on land with the pup as well um so that's one way to try and identify them so the harbour seals are are smaller um smaller spots on them as well and have pups in summer that aren't white gray seals bigger bigger pelage markings and have pups in winter that are white. So the history of grey seals is kind of interesting. Um, oh, I've just missed the slide anyway. <laughs> so uh, well, first off, before we get on to history, let's talk about how we even know all this that I'm telling you about seals. So um, every year there's a special committee on seals that meet and they report um, issues on population size, they report about uh, any issues they found in the research in the previous year, so if there's anything that's impacting the seals. So it's a, basically a team of researchers and experts that report to the government every year about what they've found about the seals in the previous year. So one of these things is population size. So we know how many seals there are roughly around the coast by doing aerial surveys. So this is um, uh, planes and helicopters fly around the whole coast of the UK just about and they take pictures out of the bottom which is like one of these pictures that I've got in the bottom left corner and from that you're able to count the number of seals that you can see there so you can see on this one it looks reasonably simple enough but would just take a lot of time for the whole of the UK but for areas where they're say on rocky ground and you can't really tell the difference between the seals and the, the rocks underneath some of the uh, helicopters and the planes have actually got thermal imaging so they're able to pick out the hot heat spots to work out where the seals are which I thought was pretty cool. So from those aerial surveys we're able to know how many seals there are roughly uh, around the UK. So in the harbour seals there's about 45,000 uh, according to the latest count and for grey seals there's three times that many so there's 150,000 seals. So it's important to know, and I think it's pretty impressive that the UK and especially Scotland actually has um, some of the, some globally important proportions of seals uh, on our shores. So there's, um, we're really privileged actually to have them in the fourth and in Scotland, but how are they doing in the fourth? So it's kind of a tale that's quite different for each, species so harbour seals are declining and they have been for quite some time now on the east coast of Scotland and um, there's about 40 percent less harbour seals than there were in the 90s and that is kind of still going they're still declining um, but that's not the same all around the coast of Scotland so in other areas they're either stable or increasing but for here and for the fourth they're in decline unfortunately uh, on the other hand grey seals it's kind of the opposite they're increasing and they've been increasing and for a long time. So um, in 2018, which is when the latest count was, there was almost 7,000 pups born in the fourth. So that's normally in haul out sites like the Isle of May, Fast Castle, which is between St. Abbs and Dunbar and on Inchkeith. So um, it's the grey seals that have got are the bigger seals, bigger population and also increase. And so and the harbour seals are the smaller ones and that are decreasing for us in the fourth at least anyway. So, um, historically, uh, both species of seal have actually been hunted for human consumption, i.e. for human food. Um, and this is evident from um, mid and so like old compost heap toilet kinds of things on the Isle of May, on Inchkeith and then on Fife Nest, they've found evidence of human consumption of seals. And I think this went on until reasonably recently, so maybe a few hundred years ago. Um, seals have also been hunted for the fur, for the oil, for the blubber and for the meat. 
Um, and in more recent times, they've also been hunted due to this perception of an overpopulation or, and or a competition with fishermen. So fishermen expressed concern that they were impacting cod and salmon stocks. And even wardens on the Farne Islands actually ex expressed concern that the overpopulation of grey seals was damaging puffin and turn burrows. So these calls unfortunately led to culls around the coastline um, of grey seals. Uh, I'm going to play some footage now, so if there's any little eyes then just um, turn them away or if you don't want to, to see. Um, so this footage was taken in Orkney, but on the Farne Islands these culls were actually carried out, believe it or not, by the National Trust, which I was really surprised to read. And the culls were also happening in Orkney, on Shetland and on the Hebrides. It's thought though that the culls on the Farne Islands um, might have been what kickstarted the population on the Isle of May, because the Isle of May there wasn't ever a cull on there, so we're thinking that maybe the Isle of May was kind of a safe haven from the Far Isles, which aren't too far away from us uh, up here in the fall. So I think this largely happened with the public being a bit unaware of what was going on. But it was the same time, like the 60s and the 70s, when the TVs were putting out all images of Greenpeace and Sea Shepherd and Bridget Bardot going to the Canadian pack ice with the where the harp seals were being killed. So they're the, the fluffy white ones with the big black crying eyes and they were Greenpeace were leading a campaign to try and stop the culls in Canada of them being killed on the ice and showing all these big images of like white seals and fluffy cute and then all the blood all over the ice and I think when the UK realized that actually this these videos weren't taken in Canada these are off the top of Scotland and um, there was kind of an out uproar and alongside the campaigns from Greenpeace and Sea Shepherd, the calls stopped in the UK, thankfully. And interestingly, or I suppose ironically, it was around this time that scientists uh, showed that seals weren't really eating the things that made them direct competition to fishermen, so they were mainly eating sand eels. And unfor the unfortunate truth, for the fishermen at least, was that it was likely overfishing that was causing the collapse of fitox, rather than the seals who had had their fingers pointed at them. So grey seals become protected, the numbers have grown rapidly, and now they're even commoner than they have been for centuries, and possibly than they've ever been. So it isn't only seals that have been hunted by humans for centuries, it's also uh, whales. So until relatively recently, human consumption of marine mammal meat or products was quite a normal thing for the UK, believe it or not. In fact, I found this quote from a book in 1881, which is quoting an older book from the 1500s that says that harbour porpoise is said to be excellent to eat. It's got excellent meat, dark in colour, large in fibre, of excellent flavour, very tender and full of gravy, which the last bit I thought was a bit weird. <laughs> um, so until around a thousand years ago, eating meat was pretty opportunistic. So people weren't really going out and hunting whales, but if one washed up on the beach, then that was great and that would be would feed them for six months. So it wasn't until about a thousand years ago when the Vikings turned up and they changed all of this. So they changed it to active hunting. So going out to sea to actively chase and hunt and um, capture whales. Um, this then became a commercial enterprise around the Middle Ages. And by about the 1750s, most Scottish ports were whaling. So whaling is very much ingrained in Scottish history. And actually the initial focus of Scotland's whaling ports were all around the Forth, even lots of little towns like Anstruther uh, and Dunbar, Kirkcaldy, they were all had their own whaling stations, whether they lasted a few years or a few centuries um, varies a bit. So initially the boats went north, so they were going up to the Arctic looking for bowhead whales. And on the way there, sometimes they'd catch lots of seals in the thousands, stop in nearby ports, land the oil in the skins of the seals, and then continue north uh, to carry on the voyage to carry on capturing whales. Um, so over this sort of whaling period in the Arctic, they were catching um, thousands, tens of thousands of whales and millions of seals, which I just find kind of terrifying when I think about how excited I am to see one seal or one whale and the thought of uh, killing 
uh, millions is, is just quite mind boggling, really. So um, when whaling, so now we're getting on to later years. So whaling became industrialized with steam and then fossil fuel powered engines and factory ships. And Leith just outside Edinburgh was home, the home base of one of the biggest whaling companies in the world and it only ceased trading just over 50 years ago which is quite scary so if you've ever walked around Leith past the nice cafes the fancy boat hotel you might have seen the harpoon gun at Leith docks so this belonged on one of the whaling ships operated by a company um ran by Christian Salverson so he lived in Edinburgh he set up whaling stations in Iceland in the Falklands uh, the Shetlands and eventually in South Georgia and it was this one which he named Leith Harbour in honour of his, of his home harbour. And it became one of the biggest whaling stations on record. The station ran until really recently, so it only closed in the 60s, which means that there's plenty of um, whalers that work there that are still uh, alive today. Um, in its heyday, the, the operation was sending back 8,000 tonnes of oil. So that's for things like margarine, soap, oil for oil lamps. And they were making profits of £300,000 a year back in the 1920s. So if you think about that now, today's equivalent is about £100 million. So a lot of money to be made uh, in whaling. And actually every worker there was a shareholder. So it was in the workers' interest to catch more whales, to process them efficiently and to keep on top of the game. But the UK stopped whaling in the 1960s and there was a worldwide moratorium on whaling in the 80s. Um, but some countries have chosen to ignore this ban. So countries like Iceland, Norway, Japan and the Faroes are still whaling. And you'll have seen in the news recently, another horrible picture coming up, um, the news of the recent call of a one and a half thousand Atlantic white sided dolphins in the Faroes. Um, it's obvious that taking out such a huge amount of animals is going to have effects on the population and loss of culture, for example. But one thing to consider when we're talking about whaling and marine mammals that I don't think people um, have thought about too much is that the fair the swimming distance between Faroes and Scotland isn't actually very far it's maybe one or two days swim so when we're looking at these pictures it does make me wonder whether some of them are from the populations that we're really excited to see over in Scotland and actually they've swam over to the Faroes so many of our marine mammals roam much more widely like I was talking about the humpbacks that go up to Iceland and Norway down to Cape Verde so when they're in Scottish waters, they're protected with our laws, our marine protected areas. When they go out of our territorial waters, they lose that protection. So when we're considering stresses on marine mammals that we see around Scotland, then in reality, um, modern whaling is still a threat potentially and very real for some of the marine mammal species that we have here. So enough enough grumpy stuff. Um, so behind, besides hunting marine mammals, uh, humans have also hunted fish um, for thousands of years. So this has got an impact on the fish and on the sea and on the resources within the sea. And if it's mismanaged, then we end up changing the ecosystem that the marine mammals live in themselves. So in the 1800s, two scientists said that the sea could not be depleted and that it was inexhaustible, which, thank goodness, other scientists didn't agree with them. And there was actually fishermen, even in the 1800s, that realised that the, there was something the matter. They were doing too much fishing and it was taking them a lot more effort to catch the same amount of fish. So this started off with them um, bringing in a three mile limit to stop trawling close into to land. Um, which helped a little bit, but then ultimately there was a whole ban on the whole of the fourth for trawling in the 1800s. So even 150 years ago, we were, we were aware that we couldn't exploit the sea like um, we had been doing. And evidence was mounting of depleted stocks. Um, so another example is off the coast of Edinburgh, uh, used to have the biggest uh, 
beds of oysters in the whole of the UK until 1900 when they just went virtually extinct due to overfishing and due to bad regulation. So industrialization of vessels, of steam power, new techniques like beam trawling has really impacted what we can fish for in the fourth and ultimately what's available to us and also what's available to marine mammals. So I think it's really interesting to think about that we now think of seals and, and seabirds as preferring sand eels and that's what they rely on and what they eat. But realistically, I wonder whether if we hadn't fished all those other fish like herring and cod and haddock out of the fourth, whether or not they might have been after those as well. So modern in the fourth has, has had to change to account for what's here. So we now fish for things like lobsters, crabs, razor clams, and these aren't particularly foods that are of much interest to marine mammals. Um, but the techniques that we use to fish for these um, uh, crabs and lobsters might have an impact on marine mammals. So lobsters and creels are caught by catching, uh, putting creels out, which is what this chap's doing on the video. So he's pulling in his creels to see if he's caught anything. So if you look on the right hand side, you can see what these look like on the seabed. So there's um, a whole fleet of creels here laid out, all attached by a rope. And then there's one rope that goes from the bottom of the seabed up the surface. And this is what the fisherman's looking for when he wants to go and pick up his creels. This is his sign to say, here are your fleet of creels at the bottom of the sea. But it's actually this loose bit of rope in the water that goes from the seabed up to the surface that can be a bit of a risk to marine mammals. So they swim past it, they perhaps get caught around a pectoral flipper, uh, maybe spin around to have a look what it is, and maybe even like the feeling of the rope on the skin because some marine mammals can be quite tactile. Um, but once they've sp swum around a bit, all of a sudden it's entangled and that's them entangled in line. So best case scenario for the whale is that they can swim, swim hard enough that the leading line kind of breaks away. Uh, so they have the rope around them, which hopefully they can get rid of and it'll come off uh, quickly enough. There is evidence that this does happen because there's whales that have been seen with scars from ropes, but they don't have the rope uh, on them anymore and they're healthy and okay. So there is evidence that they do get, uh, break free. Um, uh, however, if for the fishermen, that means them losing all his gear, losing all the catch um, that he's got in there. And also it's, it's kind of littering, it's absolutely not by choice, but there's a, a whole fleet of creels left ghost fishing at the bottom of the sea. So this uh, is not ideal for the fishermen at all either. Um, another scenario would be that the whale doesn't manage to break away from this line and that ends up getting, um, the whale becomes, sorry, the rope becomes too tight and then they can't get to the surface. And in that case, it would be uh, drowning due to uh, kind of complications with entanglement. So struggling to reach the surface to breathe. So this is what happened on the next slide. So again, it's a pretty, pretty haunting picture. So if you've got little eyes, maybe tell them to look, look away. Uh, so this minky was found uh, by divers off of Shetland with a rope entangled around its jaw. Uh, so they thought that it drowned pretty quickly because it just couldn't get to the surface because it had got that entangled around it. So now a bit closer to home. This is a humpback whale that washed up off Dunbar a few years ago. Um, kind of especially sad because there had been a rescue mission attempted to try and save an entangled whale that had been spotted in the fourth, but unfortunately it didn't work out. Um, so it just demonstrates it really is quite close to home, uh, this happening. So something that we do really need to think about in the fourth is, is ropes in the water. So entanglement is really killing a lot of our large whales. So since 1992, of all the larger bathing whales that have been necropsis by SMAS, so that's um, around Scotland, 46% of them had died due to entanglement, which I think is kind of terrifying. But um, what I want to reiterate from this is that this isn't really only a problem for the large whales. So in the past five years, two killer whales have died due to entanglement around Scotland. Um, there was a recent video of Risso's, a Risso's dolphin entangled in a line that a fisherman actually made, managed to break it free in the Murray Firth and it looked like it was okay. Um, 
And last year, uh, I tried in vain to rescue a grey seal that was wrapped in a creel flea off the Isle of May. So this isn't a problem that's unique to the large whales. So what can we do about it? Um, well, really excitingly, there's some relatively new gear uh, being trialled um, all around Scotland right now and over the next few years. So if you're a fisherman and you'd like to try it out and see how it goes, then absolutely get in touch with Kim, who's on this video, or with me, and I can pop you in touch. I'll just play the video because it demonstrates much better than how I could explain how it works. America and Canada. But new technologies are being explored by researchers with help from the Scottish creel fishing industry. What the idea of this ropeless fishing system is, is to eliminate all of this, which is where boats and, and whales and other things get entangled, and to just store everything at depth right alongside the creels. The idea of this is that the rope sits in a bag or a container on the seabed next to the last creel, and then when you press a button, you, you activate a transponder, this device here, and uh, it releases um, the, the boys, and the boys bring the rope up to the surface. So the, the real difference is that the rope isn't in the water column the whole time. And, uh, and that means for animals like basking sharks or whales or the likes, there, there's almost no chance of entanglement because there's no rope there to get entangled into. For the fishermen and for us, it's important to see the technology in action. A stormy day won't stop this, and the creel and the bag are chucked over the side. Three, two, one. When the pots are ready to be harvested, an acoustic signal is sent to the bag from the boat, releasing the boys, and they rush to the surface. Why is all this so... Oh, I think that uh, ropeless uh, fishing is very cool, so definitely get in touch. If you know a fisherman or poke any creel fishermen, if you know them who want to get involved and get them to try that using this technology, I think the trials have been going pretty well so far. But if you don't know a fisherman, there's plenty of other things that you can do. So you can check out the Scottish Entanglement Alliance to learn more about their work and what they're doing. You can do beach cleans to stop the uh, ghost fishing, uh, getting back into the sea and entangling whales, because it, it's not just the active fishing gear, it's also the gear that's been lost can, that can cause it entanglement as well. Um, another way you can help is to do a creel marker count. So that's kind of a way of estimating how much rope there is in the water, roughly. So I'll talk a bit more about that because that's just part of the Scottish Vessel Project, which I'll just get onto in a few slides. So plenty of things you can do to help. So in terms of threats, um, we've talked about fishing uh, in terms of rope in the water water but alongside this fishing obviously tends to require a boat to go to sea so there's lots of fishing that goes on in the fourth but it's absolutely not only fishermen that are on boats in the fourth we've got tourist trips to the island cruise ships lifeboats warships recreational boaters who might have yachts speed boats jet skis kayakers paddle boarders there are loads of different types of vessels on the water in the fourth and they each pose their own different kind of risk to marine mammals and the risk also completely varies on the behavior of the vessel as well. So are their engines off? Are they silent underwater? So uh, let's think about noise for a minute and how being in a noisy environment can be quite stressful. So think about say cities or roadworks versus lovely pristine silence in the middle of the countryside. And one thing to consider with noisiness is it means we've got to shout louder. So let's look at some examples of marine mammals. So my amazing supervisor, disclaimer here, these are not from the fourth, these are from over in Canada, has provided some recordings of, of ships and I want to see if you think you can hear anything in the background. So that's a ship that was recorded on a hydrophone two kilometers away. And by some fancy acoustic stuff that I can't do or understand, they um, managed to pull this out. So this was actually in the background um, of this recording. So that's a killer whale from J-Pod that was a kilometer away. So if we listen to the container ship again, you can begin to get an idea of how these whales can call to each other and they just can't hear each other or they perhaps miss hearing what each other's saying to each other if they're trying to communicate. So let's play this again. Uh, 
Um, I've got another example as well. So here's a ferry that was recorded. So did you hear any sounds of marine life? I didn't think so when I first listened to it, but this is actually what was in the background. So this is a humpback whale. So if we play the ferry again, So these are examples of acoustic masking, where vessel noise can be masking um, communication, important if they're trying to catch fish, may if they're trying to organise where they're going. Um, so one way you can alleviate this immediately is if by switching your engine off if you're in the vicinity of marine mammals. And by switching your engine off, if you're a boat with propellers, that also alleviates the risk of injury uh, as well. But there are plenty of other Things that you can do that can help alleviate your risk to marine mammals uh, but when we're thinking about risk in terms of vessels other things we can consider are like is the vessel behaving erratically so is it going from fast to slow and going in all different directions is it hard to predict or is it staying on a constant course and a constant speed and it does tend to be the constant course and the constant speed boats that get the bow riding like in the top, top video up there so these variations in vessel behaviour can lead to a real variation in them, how marine mammals respond. Um, so it's pretty difficult to predict though. Um, so this leads me on to the Scottish Vessel Project, which is beginning to collect a little bit of data on this. So the Scottish Vessel Project is led by myself and my supervisor, Lauren McWinney, based at Harriet Watt University, but it's a collaborative project with lots of different people. So they're all shown on the next slide. But what we're interested in is capturing marine vessel data around Scotland. So we're doing this in lots of different ways through time-lapse cameras, uh, through collecting um, AIS data, which is basically tracking information uh, of, of large or commercial vessels. We're also digitising citizen science data. So here's all the sightings that have been posted on the fourth marine mammals page uh, between May and August. So you can just begin to get an idea of how much stuff there is in the fourth and how important it is for marine mammals. And then in collaboration with WDC and Shorewatch, um, we're training volunteers to do vessel watches and to learn how to, when they're recording what marine mammals they see, to also just make a note of what vessels they're spotting at the same time as well. And like I mentioned earlier, the project's also counting creel markers to help estimate uh, rope in the water uh, and to help us be able to compare how the amount of rope in the water varies at all different sites around Scotland, but also how it varies over the course of the year. So it's a re quite recently launched, so this is the perfect time for me to be talking to you guys and trying to get some more people involved in trying to collect this vessel data. So if you're interested, if you're a Shorewatch volunteer already, you'll get your training through them. Or well, you can sign up to become a Shorewatch volunteer and there'll be the dedicated vessel watch training as part of that. Um, or if not, the, there's a YouTube video that's just 20 minutes long, so you can watch that and get a bit of an idea more about the project and about how to do these vessel watches. And then if you get in touch with me or with the Showwatch team, I can share some sheets with you of what to fill in and show you what to do. Another more simple way that you can contribute is just always by remembering if you ever see any marine mammal in the fourth, even if it's a seal, it doesn't have to be a dolphin or whale, uh, record it on the Fourth Marine Mammals Facebook page and that way the data will be incorporated into these maps to give us a really good idea of who's in the fourth and where and when and which areas are important for different species of marine mammals. So whether you've got five minutes to report a uh, sighting on the Fourth Marine Mammals page or if you've got half an hour to do a dedicated vessel watch, there's lots of things you can do to help. So this brings me on to the final slide, so don't panic. I'm not about to go through this with you at all uh, at eight o'clock on a Thursday night, but I wanted to have this slide so you guys could take a picture or a screenshot or we can email at you afterwards. But you're all here because you obviously care about marine mammals, um, but we've all got different skills and different 
uh, aspects of conservation that I guess we're interested in. So I just wanted to make a big slide full of all the different things that you can get involved in and contribute to. So um, there's things like if you've taken pictures, different uh, places you can um, send those to, if you've seen predation, if you've found a dead or an, dead or an injured marine mammal, or if you're particularly concerned about certain uh, aspects of impacts to marine mammals. So if you're concerned about vessels or ropes, or if you want to do some training on, on being um, better behaved on a boat around them, you can do the WISE scheme. So there's lots of different things that you can get involved in. So I'll just leave that up for another 10 seconds for you to take some pictures of how you can be involved. And I just want to reiterate that the ocean is huge and vast. There absolutely aren't enough people researching it as if there were, I still wouldn't have all these questions that I've been talking about for this talk. So it isn't without the help of everyone joining in on projects like this that we can continue to understand and conserve the seas. So thank you and I look forward to any questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Emily, for that. That was fascinating and full of lots of interesting data and references to projects that are ongoing. Really, really interesting. So thank you for that. Um, so now, everybody, we've got time uh, for some questions to put to Emily. Um, we've already had a question come through from Grant during the talk. So thank you very much to Grant for posting a question. It's in relation to noise pollution. So Grant was wondering, could noise pollution be a cause of increased incidences of whales, etc., being found in the Firth, uh, Firth of Forth due to them being disorientated? Um, so if, if I heard the question right, it's are, the, are, are whales potentially turning up in the Forth because they're disorientated because of noise? Yeah. yeah, so this is a bit of a funny, funny one, really, and I don't know if it's as much of a problem in the fourth as it is for other areas of Scotland or maybe other areas of the world. But um, if you remember last year, like towards the end of last year, there was a military training exercise over on the West Coast where they were potentially doing quite a lot of noisy underwater sound operations. And then that coincided with um, a lot of beaked whales being seen there that ultimately stranded that wouldn't normally be in that close to shore and then um, were disorientated and potentially stranded because of that. So I think it's not necessarily a reason I think we ha we see those species in the fourth, but I think for other areas, um, when there's definitely lots of noisy things going on, you can a few days later suddenly see um, unexpected species or strandings for sure, yeah. Great, thank you. Uh, a question here from Pete. Pete was asking, there were reports of increasing numbers of squid and fish in East Scotland. Does this coincide with Emily's experience? You know, I don't think I've ever seen a squid on the boat all the time that I've been out, which is rubbish, isn't it? Although I did actually, I'm telling a lie actually, on the dolphin surveys, when I was going out of the end of the Tay, we saw, um, the bottlenose dolphins playing with squid. So sometimes we'd see them playing with seaweed and then one day, yeah, playing with squid. And I do think they eat them sometimes. So uh, I've lost track of what the question was about whether I've seen more fish and squid uh, on the fourth. Yeah, so yeah, I'm more of a marine mammal person. So I've not been keeping too much of an eye on the, the fishing, but I bet there's some fishermen on here that could answer that question better than me. <laughs> Fabulous. Uh, lovely. There's one here from Kirsten. She says that was great. Thank you. Yeah. Slightly out of area, but I'm on the Berkshire coast. We have a large set of population of grey seals in the bay here. Just this year, I have seen some, some more common seal pups in the bay too, and they seem to be starting a colony on the opposite side of the bay. Is this usual? That's really exciting. Yeah, <laughs> that's really good to hear that there's some harbour seals around here somewhere. Um, I think it's quite usual for them to live on side, alongside each other. So this is quite fascinating. So in some areas, they live alongside each other quite happily. And you'll see, like, even I went along to West Weems and I was watching the seals there and taking some pictures. And they're right next to each other, they don't seem to yap at each other too much. But then there's other areas in Scotland, including in the Forth, where um, predation on 
it from grey seals on harbour seals has been seen and even grey seals eating grey seal pups uh, there's big males that are predating on them so it always makes me a little bit nervous when I know that there's the same species in the area but I think the predation is tends to be sort of one male so if there's not a sort of predatory male in the area then they can live alongside each other quite fine I think and I think actually they exploit different size fish so they're not even always in direct competition they might be going for a, bit, a little bit bigger fish the grey seals or different species so yeah but that's super exciting there's some harbour seals that have started a pupping site in Berwickshire. Absolutely. Always lovely to see uh, see pups, isn't it? Absolutely wonderful. Wonderful. There's some more questions coming through. Thank you, everybody. So one from our tech team. Uh, we're asking, we saw the sci whale come very close into shore earlier this year. Is that normal behaviour for, for, for such a large whale? I don't think, I don't know the definite answer to this because I have really no experience with sci whales apart from that it came to here this year because uh, they're really not usual visitors to even the North Sea um, but I know that there was other videos or sightings of it like feeding just under the fourth rail bridge as well like really close to shore like I think the people that were taking the video on the shore had to move out of the way because it was so close in so from if that happened also at over at North Berwick that's really fascinating that that was going on all around the fourth so I have seen quite a few little fish like um if you just go and stand at the end of the pier or whatever or go snorkeling there's lots of little fish so I do wonder if that's what they're they're going after be interesting to know be interesting to talk to our fishermen to see what they've been seeing Absolutely. Yeah, as you were saying, it's um, so we regularly see the bottlenose dolphins come up right, right close to the harbour in North Berwick, which is very, very lovely to have an office which overlooks that. So you just, you know, working on any computer and there's a bottlenose dolphin just out the window. Yeah. Wonderful to have that. But then it's obviously to have the, the side whale and the increasing sightings for humpbacks. It's really starting to become a really good hot spot for people to go and see those whales. Yeah. And We're very spoiled, I think. It seems crazy. I remember coming to university, so I went to St Andrews and I went to St Andrews not because I thought there was any marine mammals around here, but just to go to the university to do marine biology. And it's amazing to think of all the things that are here now that are so close to shore, like you can see them from land. Absolutely. Wonderful. More questions coming in. Fantastic. Um, another one from our team. How much of a concern is climate change to our marine mammals? Yeah, climate change is a scary one, isn't it? Because it's a bit of an, an unknown because there's so many question marks. So there's things like um, all of the prey that I was talking about, like the sand eels and the herring that the, the seals rely on and harbour porpoise rely on, for example, they cannot all be really impacted by climate change and we don't really know how they're going to be impacted or affected um and there's also things like warmer water marine mammal species might come up here more and start competing with our usual scottish species so we might start seeing species that we don't really expect up here or we might and then the colder water species might start moving north and we might lose some of those species so yeah that's a really big question mark that is is quite scary but it might mean that we see quite a lot of things that we're not used to seeing I suppose. Great um Sarah has put in a question about humpback whales she was wondering if you think humpback whales should be designated as protected marine features in Scottish Seas I know there's a lot of debate on whether they are uh, whether they are becoming more res resident species than transient. That's a really good question yeah and it's a really good debate that I think a lot of even marine mammal scientists don't agree with about whether or not um, designating marine mammals who are like highly mobile and who aren't always in our waters whether or not designating them certain areas or whatever is useful personally I think it is because I think it's better to get them as much protection as possible so that's why the things like the fourth marine mammals page when people are recording what they're seeing that's a way over the past four years that we've now got uh, records of what's been seen here so we can go and show the government and show decision makers look like this bit of the fourth is has had humbugs come into it for the past 10 years maybe and by that stage you'll really have a good amount of evidence to say this is a really important patch that they keep coming back to um yeah so i think i think it's getting to the stage if this carries on with the humbugs 
come in here for a longer that you would definitely have a case for saying can we think about slowing vessels down in that certain area if it was apparent that vessels were an issue or whatever we thought we needed to do to protect them while they were were here even just like a little seasonal protection when they were here because it seems to be in like between January and March that they're here so yeah absolutely yes data and knowledge is power in this isn't it <laughs> Um, and on the note of uh, data collection and citizen science, Maggie's asking about uh, Facebook. She's where Facebook is a place where you can report sightings, but uh, is that the only place that you can? So I was wondering, because you have that fantastic slide, which we'll yeah. share to everybody again, um, uh, whilst, what, after, just after we're finished, so you can get a, a note of all those projects. But I don't know if you'd like to summarise. Yeah, I'll try and summarise, but I'll probably <laughs> forget lots of them. So this really depends on where you live, or it's not even actually where you live, it's where you've seen the marine mammal. So if you're over on the West Coast, um, the Hebridean Whale and Dolphin Trust has made this amazing app that you can just click where you are and it records your location. So you don't even have to write that in, you just write what species you've seen, how certain you are that you've seen it, and that puts a little dot on their map of what you've seen and when. So that's the Hebridean, Hebridean Whale and Dolphin Trust Whale Track app. So if you're ever over on the West Coast, you can use that. And then for over on this side, there's the Fourth Marine Mammals Facebook page. But then there's um, similar Facebook pages all around the coast of Scotland. So there's one for Shetland, there's one for Orkney, um, there's one for like the Caithness and the Murray Coast. And I think there's one for Aberdeenshire and there's one for Berwickshire as well. For, so there's, there's loads of different Facebook pages that you can um, record your sightings on there. You can also report them to Sea Watch Foundation, who they have been monitoring sightings for, I think it's 30 or 40 years. So that's for the whole of the UK. And then the Shore Watch as well that you can d submit your sightings to. So I'm sure I've forgotten loads of places, but this it's pretty overwhelming actually to think about how many there are. And it's good to try and report them to them all, but I think you'd be on your computer all day if you did. <laughs> Lovely. Okay, we have got a question from Callum saying, fantastic presentation, thanks very much. And uh, a question about sharks. What type of sharks do you see in the birth? I've heard anecdotes about poor beagles, but are there others? I'm going to wimp out of this question completely because I'm useless at sharks. So if anybody else is on the call who knows about sharks in the fourth, that I'd I'd actually really like to know. The only thing that I know about is that on the dolphin surveys, we saw every so often a basking shark. Um, but other than that, not sure. So please, if anybody wants to unmute themselves and, and answer that, I'd be really interested to know as well. Yeah, absolutely. That would be yeah. really interesting to know. And the Shark Trust is also a fantastic organisation that are based in, in the UK that have um, do all these amazing things like the Great Egg Case Hunts and things like that. Yeah. So it's a science project that um, basically you can, you can report where you find an egg case that's washed up on a beach and they can tell you what species it is and things like that. So they, the Shark Trust is a great place to find out more information about sharks. Um, uh, oh, Kirsten said the swordfish. There was a swordfish spotted in the first, wasn't there? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I never got to see it though. I mean, yeah. So that I think that was in the like nearer towards Kingholm, wasn't it? And it was kind of doing the rounds. But I did see something recently that it's potentially been one spotted a bit further out, but I think a bit further down the coast. So it'd be interesting if that comes back. It's amazing all the stuff that's getting seen in the fall. Yeah. It it is, isn't it? And I think just goes to show how much we're still learning about the marine environment and how much the advances in technology and I suppose how many eyes are on the water is definitely helping us know more about yeah, it as well. Yeah. Uh, another question from Pete. He's asked, do you recommend the use of eye records to record wildlife sightings? <laughs> That's another one. I knew I'd have got one. <laughs> so I think I've used eye record for recording sort of terrestrial stuff like um, plant species or terrestrial hedgehogs or anything like that. And I noticed that it didn't have that many marine mammal sightings on it. But I think that's just a product of people like me, like forgetting that there's so many things to put it on and they don't immediately think of that one for the marine mammal sightings. But actually a lot of scientists use that um, to pull data out of. So I definitely think if you're an active user of that anyway, then definitely pop your sightings in on there as well. 
Yeah, so we, we've doubled with using our record for the centre. So we've got a fantastic rocky shore um, just off of North Berwick. And whenever we've gone out and we've done rock pooling and we've got some photographs, we, for some events, like a BioBlitz event, we submit um, that data to iRecord, but also the photograph. And I think if you have a photograph, it's quite easy for mm. experts to then, like, basically make yeah. that like it's a valid result kind of a thing so I record I think yeah absolutely it's fantastic for catching observational data but having a photograph I think is great where with marine mammals that's quite tough isn't it to get them, <laughs> those if they're far away and jumping in the distance yeah. and just yeah, I'll always tail. Put, yeah always put your camera up at the wrong time that's me that's <laughs> definitely that's definitely for me yeah um lovely we've got another question coming through from Caroline, do you think COVID-19 played a role in increase in sea life here? Has there been a decrease in shipping? Um, this is a really interesting question. And um, so I live uh, right in the East Nuke of Fife. So COVID was a time when I spent a lot of time at home more than I normally would have and I know I saw so many marine mammals and I don't know whether that's because I was at home and I was out doing the, doing the daily exercise on the coastal path or not but the the shipping in the fourth decreased a bit for the very set lockdown period but then once we were kind of allowed back out and restrictions eased a little bit I noticed more vessel traffic than I've ever seen in the fourth like I think um, there was more people doing paddle boarding I was one of them so I'll take some blame uh, kayaking and um, there's more people buying boats and going out and there was um and I almost felt like for a period last summer and this summer there was more vessel traffic than I've ever seen on the fourth and jet skis and all sorts going on um then last year there was definitely more marine mammal sightings for me at least in the fourth than there was this year so I don't know whether that's had an effect in the fourth there are lots of really cool studies in other places around the world where they've had hydrophones in the water and they've looked at how much more if you remember there was um, recordings that I showed about acoustic masking and about how vessels can mask uh, communication um, when the vessels stop all of a sudden their communication range really expands so there's been some lots of cool reports coming out including Lauren who's on this call who definitely should uh, talk about it some more um, showing just how much more the dolphins could he hear each other for that period of time when there was lockdown and when the bigger boats went out there so I don't think there are any hydrophones in the fourth yet there's plans for some um, but yeah it'd be so interesting to know whether that had an impact but but like I say the the pages like the fourth marine mammal page if they're consistently updated with sightings and if the systematic surveys going on like sure watch then you get to get that data and have a look at it and see whether whether, whether all my silly anecdotes actually match up with the data wonderful it's great we've still got the chat going on everyone so thank you so much for, for hanging on are you okay to oh, be going for a little bit yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> all. I've had my tea. wonderful <laughs> Um, so we've got a question here from Padge. Apologies if I've mispronounced your name. Um, any known reason why one species of seal is increasing is increasing while another is decreasing? Do they compete? I think this is genu genuinely the, the million pound <laughs> question because it's been researched by the Sea Mammal Research Unit for um, at least the past four or five years. And that was one of the projects that I was working on when I was talking about doing the photo ID. So that project's still ongoing and it's it's looking at so many different reasons why it could be so they're looking at whether it's killer whale predation whether it's gray seal predation on harbor seals whether it's harmful algal blooms and um, putting toxins into the fish and whether the, the seals are eating toxic fish um they're using photo id to try and work out whether it's the adults that are dying off or the pups and so far all of the avenues there's, there's other ones as well but so far all of those avenues haven't produced any sort of concrete things of yes it's this reason so um my feeling is like with not much experience is that it might be half of a just a natural fluctuation of one species uh, over the other and then in 200 years it might the balance might change again 
Um, but we do know that grey seals are predating on harbour seals and grey seal populations are increasing. So they potentially could have an influence that we don't know about. We're not out there all the time and don't know what's going on. Um, and then there's uh, killer whales around Shetland and there's anecdotal reports of when they turn up that they're eating 15 seals from a hole outside or in a day, which is, if there's only a population of say 200 at, at one hole outside, then that's quite a, a number that they're taking. And if they're turning up every two weeks then that can soon, soon add up. So maybe it's just a combination of all these factors that's um, keeping the numbers low at least or stopping the numbers from increasing. Great, much, much to learn, much to find out. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, great, we've had a, a response from Lauren about the question about this, the, the Simon. <laughs> great, so she was saying um, that this is considered an, off, an offshore species, so that sighting of them being so far close, so close to shore was considered very unusual on a global scale. And she works with the, her colleagues in Canada were very excited um when they came into shore so yeah it's great that we've got examples um from people communicating in different countries learning from each other finding out more about it and learning techniques of how to research these amazing animals from around the world as well um so i think that's all the questions we've had at the moment in the chat so thank you for all of those questions um everybody um so i'd just like to extend my thanks to emily thank you so much for providing that talk um we will be doing more meet the scientist talks for everybody uh, who wants to maybe see some more research we've got a fantastic talk coming up next month so we're going from the cute and the magnificent to the creepy and the crawly we've got a very suitable halloween themed one about marine parasites which i know doesn't sound that appealing when you first hear about it but actually there's some amazing research going on uh, for the seabird colonies in the Firth of Forth but looking at the impacts of marine parasites on the ecology and the, and the population studies of the seabirds so actually some fantastic uh, research coming from Dr Sarah Burr from the UK Centre for Hydrology and Ecology so we'll pop the details in the chat of how to sign up for that chat for next uh, next talk for next month um, Explorathon is still going on as well well so this part this event was part of that amazing festival and there's loads online to do whether it be resources online events and also there's some in-person events going on as well so again uh, the team will be popping in a link to explore us on website in the chat for you to see and also um, it'd be great to have some feedback about tonight's event so there'll be a link put in the chat again for a very brief online survey that will feed into the Explorathon Festival to help them kind of work out what events work well, whether they do more online events in the future, the topic, things like that. So any time you can give to do that would be fantastic. And last but not least, um, because we're an environmental charity that have had a bit of hardship over lockdown, it would be wonderful if uh, anyone could spare some donations for the Seabird Centre or find out how to get more involved in our work. So there you can sign up to our Ease newsletter to get involved with some more events, or you can come to the centre, become a member, adopt a seagull or a seabird, and that will really help us to continue events just like this, but also our conservation and education work in the future as well. So we've got lots of thank yous coming through. So everyone is very happy, Emily, as are we. Thank you. And um, yes, good night, everybody. I think, Emily, if you'd like to share that, uh, that final slide of all those projects again. So if anybody would like to get a final screen shot or a photograph of those projects listed, that would be great. But otherwise, hopefully see everybody again at another Meet the Scientist. Thank you.